Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can head over to the YouTube channel and join directly at various levels or head over to patreon.com slash Aksum. Today, our guest is Augustine Dickinson. Salam alaikum and welcome to the program. Bahaka, thank you. It's a pleasure. Uh, yeah, no, this is one of the long overdue episodes, and I'm sure a lot of my guests will be clamoring to speak to you. I know I've had at least a couple people asking, and I know it's just a, a matter of getting our, our schedules right across the little pond that separates us now that used to not separate us. Um, just, just to start off, can we hear from you how you first either heard about Ethiopia or got into Ethiopian studies? Yeah, so uh, I had this kind of general interest in early Christianity, um, especially theological controversies and uh, sort of like diversity in the early church, like in Syria and Egypt and, uh, you know. Um, and so then I came across these references to, to Ethiopian Christianity. And I was like, OK, I need to know more about this. I need to know everything I can find. And I started with these, uh, these uh, some introductory articles by Getachew Haile. And of mm -hmm. course, you know, he has such a beautiful way of writing and a, and a great way of just kind of conveying everything. And I was both like, this is really, really fascinating stuff. And I really want to keep going with this. And then also I was like, okay, this is something that compared to, you know, the Western, the Western Christian tradition or a, a lot of the Eastern tradition, this is something that has so much new ground to cover, so much more to do, so much to be done. And so it's just kind of this perfect fit of like, I'm, this is really interesting and I could do this, you know, very happily for the rest of my life. And it's something that is viable to keep doing for the rest of my life. You know, it's not something that's kind of um, academically mined out, so to speak. Um, so it was just a very kind of um, right timed coming together of things uh, that worked out well. So that's brilliant. Yeah, I never had reflected up upon that piece or wondered about it for you but it seems like you were able to craft and and create your own space whereas you'd have much less room to do so if you wanted to look into an, another field well i i know that you've kind of self-described and and used words like history and literature and i imagine comparative literature but i know you're also incredible with with languages do you call yourself linguist, philologer, historian, com comparative literature guy? Like what, what is man of letters? What is, what is the, the appellation that's most appropriate in terms of like the field of study within that? The thing is like, for, so for a lot of these kind of fields, uh, you know, it's really hard to do one without doing the other, or at least I would say it's hard to do one of them right without mm -hmm. at least being a little bit involved in the other. So when it comes to like theology or linguistics, like I, I'm very far from a, a professional or an expert in these fields. You know, as soon as people start asking me about like alveolar fricatives and things like this, then I'm kind of like, okay, I, this is that's yeah. too deep for me. I I prefer to stay a bit more shallow. <laughs> but so so really, I I would say I'm more of a philologist and um, also someone who works on manuscripts. Um, that's really the sort of core of what I do. And then, you know, inevitably to do that, you should also be working a bit, you have to understand a bit of the theology, a bit of the linguistics, a bit of the culture, you know, all of these kind of things. So, but manuscripts yeah. is really where I keep my my sort of academic base. Yeah, that that's great. So you you started off with Gita Johaila, you could have started off with someone better. Um, I I have had the experience, particularly I would say in like, the older something is and some of the British writings that I have read where I, especially like as a deacon, just get frustrated sometimes when I see like the word monophysite written a million times or, you know, a sort of uh, writing. Off. I understand, for example, in the older sources, just calling it the Coptic church. You know, I, I get it, you know, because of the special relationship that Alexandria and Aksum and later Addis Ababa had. But uh, I wonder, are you always able to keep a level head as you 
as you uh, were reading this stuff like uh, in the beginning you're just getting introduced so i'm wondering like when your discernment mechanism was able to kick in <laughs> within your studies that's a good question i don't know that i can recall a, a like certain moment where it really kicked in um i feel like when you kind of look at things side by side like when you look at some of these uh you know early western publications and then you actually look at the manuscripts for yourself and you mm -hmm. um also have the experience of like actually seeing an ethiopian church and actually participating and not just being kind of this observer who doesn't uh, you know really uh, have a lot of first-hand experience with these things then what you know when you see them side by side you, it, it, i think it becomes pretty clear you're like okay well they're doing their best for their time period to be yeah. to be here on the one hand and and other issues that they have like budge being kind of racist and things like this like that's also kind of just the product of their time um but uh, yeah i don't know it's it's hard because you have to really try to filter these things like there's really valuable sort of pieces that you have to look for in these uh, older publications and then other times it's just like okay well this is really outdated now and it's not even really useful at this point now because i could just do something myself that it wouldn't take any less effort and would be <laughs> i would have better results so. yeah no a hundred percent um a, a friend of mine uh, elias who runs his eye publishers or eyes imprint mm. out of Loyola Marymount University he um through uh I think it was the Babeshetu uh, I may be wrong on that helped translate into Amharic the the powder barrel by Roman Prochaska and a lot of people found that kind of short manuscript so offensive they didn't even want to read it because it was kind of the you know the colonial blueprint for disintegrating Ethiopia that a lot of people tie to the politics of today without getting into it um but he believed that it was useful even to read that to be able to be in the shoes or the moccasins or be able to empathize with uh, a, a position that was not pro you know ethiopian at least from a few points of view uh they, they i think the guy thought he was pro ethiopian in a in a in a different sense <laughs> uh in in the sense of ruling ethiopia <laughs> from from afar um my own grandfather translated into amharic henry blank's a narrative captivity of abyssinia which talks about from the perspective of one of the uh, alleged medical doctors i personally think he might have been a spy as well but uh, a medical doctor that was captured by uh emperor theodore or as Theodros. and and if you read a lot of that stuff again you like people would be offended but in his uh forward my grandfather says the reason why you read this is because you can sift through and find the important historical details that would be there professor Tadesetamrat, also famous for being innovative in in gleaning history from the the gudla to the hagiographies that i think a lot you read of my mind <laughs> right yeah, yeah so, exactly so but to engage at all you've emphasized i think this is your historian aspect on access direct access to the manuscripts which allow you to then compare to what other people have said i think i've met a lot of people who have a passing interest a curiosity in ethiopian studies but the way you've dedicated yourself uh you have to have studied Giz <laughs> to do so so uh, or what you know people call Ethiopic old Ethiopic classical Ethiopic many different names um wondering if you first have any thoughts on Giz versus Ethiopic and then if you could talk about how you learned it like was it just uh totally on your own did you have a, a Yeneta <laughs> I mean Ethiopic has the advantage that um, people who are not specialists can immediately identify what you're referring to mm -hmm. uh but Giz really drives home the 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 true tradition of it and um i don't think that we on the, it depends on the circumstance i think in some cases it's really advantageous to try to be as inclusive as possible for uh you know colleagues in related fields but for for good as at least I, it's 
if if that's their extra little bit of exposure to actual Goethe's is hearing just the name Goethe's, <laughs> yeah. then that's something nice or you know something to appreciate. <laughs> Yeah. Um, my my Persian friend, the first time I ever told him when we were kids, the the word, uh, guuz is fart in Farsi, and he thought I was saying the word fart in Farsi, and I was like, no, that's not what I'm saying. Um, and I've had some Eritrean friends. I know you have some Eritrean friends as well, who, uh, you know, obviously because of again the political separation now, the, there's a little wincing that goes on when they hear the word uh, Ethiopic. But in terms of total people. I know even very proud uh, Eritrean friends who, when random strangers ask them what they are, sometimes they'll say Ethiopian just to keep the conversation shorter. Mm -hmm. So I, I know what you mean in terms of access. Mm. And, and, and so in terms of learning, um, I really just started by myself, you know, mm -hmm. uh, flashcards with the Fidel and like, ah, blah, 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 you know, really trying. Um, and then just kind of slowly picking up uh, like words and phrases and things uh, at the same time, both just not just like reading, but then also, you know, once in a while I'd go to the, the air train church that was in the place where I, I used to live. And so then I could also, it, it was one of, it was nice because it was one of the churches where they have the words for as a, uh, you know, like on a screen, but mm -hmm. they didn't have English or any other language. They just only have the like, as <laughs> words. So yeah. it was this really great reinforcement where I could hear them doing all of the chanting and then I could see the words right there and there was nothing to help me. I just had to make sure that I learned the, the Fidel to wow. read it. And they didn't um, have the Tigrinya there. I know that no. during the, the tea hour, they certainly would speak Tigrinya. So mm -hmm. I wonder if that had any influence on you, but but there was no Tigrinya on the screen itself? Maybe it's different now, um, but but years ago at that time, they, they didn't have, it was just only the guys. Wow. And there were maybe uh, like a couple of moments here or there where a bit of a Tigrinyaism slipped in. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, it was consistently uh, Gittes, which, again, it was, it was really reinforcing. Um, Do you mean like pronouncing the G like a J or the K like a CH? I, I mean, that, that was, that's very, I, I never really had thought about that so much at the time. Um, but... Uh, I mean, just having this sort of oral aspect too, instead of just sitting there with like the IPA pronunciation and then the <laughs> letters and me just kind of, you know, in a vacuum uh, uh, learning. Um, Can you talk about that? Actually, that's interesting that I think a lot of people don't understand. I don't even know what that acronym is, but I know it's, you're talking about like the reconstructed pronunciation versus how the tradition has preserved it or not at all. You know, that's an arguable point, right? Yeah, I mean, so the International Phonetic Alphabet, right? So, um, it, I mean, it's it's very practical and useful, but uh, again, if you don't look at the IPA symbols all the time, then you won't get used to the sounds. And especially if you're looking at the reconstructed pronunciations, right, which have slev uh, or negusu sev. I mean, you you could try to read a symbol for slev, but how will you imagine that sound if you if you don't hear someone make it? Aside yeah. from the point that people don't use it anyway in in getters. Kind of yeah, which is driving me nuts if I, if I, heard, I mean, to me, it's just the most disgusting sound, I think. Uh, really? So I'm like, yeah, it's just, uh, it, it makes yeah. me cringe. Uh, <laughs> but, but the thing was, that, I mean, of course, uh, you know, I could only get so far with this. And so then I was really fortunate that when I started at the University of Toronto, they, that was exactly when they started doing Goethe's courses. Oh, nice. Um, so then I had Robert Holmstead, who's the comparative Semitics teacher there, uh, teach Goethe's. Um, and I think it was maybe the only year that they had a follow-up intermediate level course, which then I wow. also did. And which was, even though it was taught by Holmstead technically, it was more so led by uh, Deacon Fissaha, Fissaha Tedesa, who is just an amazing, amazing teacher. I mean, because of course he studied Kane so so yeah. He's and the gentleman Canada. with the Toronto Endangered Language Society that a lot of people share his video online of him speaking with his teacher in Gutes mm -hmm. on on uh, on YouTube. Exactly. And then on the same channel, they have some preservation of Gesinan or the language of Harar, the mm -hmm. Harari. Um, um, so he was in your class. Was he a TA or, or he was just uh, yeah, kind of so, auditing the class to test his knowledge? <laughs> so he was basically the, so he was the TA technically, but because uh, Holmstead was always so tired by the time the class came around, 
uh, and he knew Pisaha knew enough that he was he didn't really need to be there. He would just leave, and then Pisaha because the intermediate course was just directed readings. Mm -hmm. So we just were translating uh, like passages from Gidla, Ewos and Hewos, and Kabrindagis, and things like this. Um, so it wow. worked really well. So, I mean, it was very small. We there's only three students, <laughs> including myself. Um, well, that's an amazing class size. I'm sure it helped you learn a lot. But in terms of the beginning, did you you all use um, uh, Moshe, uh, August Dillman's uh, text, or did you use Lambdin, or did you use some other thing that you you all had there? Well, so Holmstead, uh he previously did uh, an introduction to Hebrew. Um, and so then what he sort of did was he took Lambdin's textbook uh, as a starter, and then fixed uh, or revised things that he didn't like or took issue with, and then added the same pedagogical components from his Hebrew textbook, but adapted for Gez. Um, I don't know if it's going to be published. He sometimes has sent it around uh, in different uh, circles. Um, but it was it, it's a decent text to start with. It doesn't cover everything. But uh, the thing, too, about Giz is that I think it's a really great language to learn simply by reading and practicing more mm -hmm. so than, um, you know, reading the grammar only and focusing on it from this uh, uh, artificial kind of perspective. Um, that, this is also what I did when I was tutoring Giz. I would mostly encourage people to just start reading. And if they don't know words, then I can help them pick out the word or if, the grammar is a bit unclear. I can help them with that. But you learn so much faster, and especially for good is just to, you know, go in the deep end and start reading than to always be kind of holding back and like, oh, but I think I need to practice the grammar a bit more. Oh, I need to practice the vocabulary a bit more. Like, if you keep doing that, there's a chance you'll just kind of never stop doing that. And then, mm -hmm. you know, and, and good is it's so diverse, too, depending on which period you're, the literature you're reading is from, what genre it's in. So, again, just trying to go from textbook exercises isn't going to give you enough of enough or the kind of exposure that you that you need to really progress so. yeah that's right so when you started studying i don't know how much time you spent for example on inscriptions or the garima gospels you more are i don't know the 12 or at least 13 1400s to to the present is that is that right well, or did you have a cut actually, off date i should say um so homestead because he's uh interested in comparative semitics and because he's interested in always like the earliest kind of layer of things his textbook and his interest in good is, is only in the green gospels actually oh wow um, so that's also kind of the funny thing about the textbook too is that you might be inclined to see you, 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 you'll see things that you might think then are normal, but really are just limited to the Grima Gospels and would seem unusual in later kids. Um, but that also kind of makes it fun and interesting too. So. Is there any particular Masari that comes to mind that, that you think is, is, is it just like spellings of things or totally different words or like switched consonants? Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, so spelling is one thing, uh, maybe a few pieces of vocabulary that, that kind of fell out. Um, the one I remember is that in the pronunciation exercises, he has, um, um, I forget exactly, it's like M, uh, or like it's it's a, a word that starts with M and then it has M, the, the preposition prefix to it. And it's written with two six order M's in a row. And I said, well, this isn't right. You don't put two uh, you know, <laughs> letters like this in a row. And he said, ah, but it happens sometimes in, in Garima. And so then I'm like, oh, okay, well, I, mean, I don't know yeah. that that's, again, I don't know that that's great for teaching people to get used to that. But yeah. <laughs> or just <laughs> to keep to keep the students humble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so then how did you find within all the years of giz i mean um i know there's some there's some ranges uh, right between the was it the 400s and the 600s for when they they place the garima gospels in terms of yeah, how old like they that. believe it is but even let's say with the conservative estimate 
uh, we're talking about over a thousand years of literature, even if we went from the 600s to beyond the 1600s. Uh, I think the main Amharic literature takeover is around the 1800s and, and really not the strongest until the 20th century. So how did you within that thousand year plus range begin to to find a niche did you did you like open random uh manuscripts <laughs> at, at random and say this one like this one is calling to me well i uh i mean my focus for my research used to be the history of magic and that was mm -hmm. in a large part because my my old supervisor was david Krakow, uh, who focuses on the, the history of magic um and because i had started by reading getachu and since Getachu had done all this work on Zoryakov and the Stephanites and this kind of period, and because also I was, my, my background was in medieval studies, um, all of my focus initially was on, uh, you know, precisely this period, so Zoryakov's literature. Um, but then now, I mean, now I studied Melk poetry. Mm -hmm. That was just kind of, uh, again, a sort of happy accident that I had always just read descriptions of, of Melk uh, poems and I had you know seen some of them in books and I thought like this is such a an interesting idea for, as, as a literary genre and you know when I had read bits and pieces of them I was always thinking like it's such an interesting style and the compositions sometimes are really beautiful and when they chanted too I mean I think to, to me it's my favorite you know chant to listen to and to participate in is to, to hear Melk uh, being chanted um, but it was always kind of like a side interest. And then when I came here and I, now I'm not bound to the, the Middle Ages, uh, I was like, well, okay, <laughs> now, I can, now I can choose to do Melk, uh, you know, completely freely. I can study Melk that were composed in the past, uh, you know, century, and I can study Melk that are several centuries older, so. That's uh, right, that's right, so because you've completed the, the master's and you're in your PhD uh, program right now. I, I want to get and deep dive into the Melk. I actually talked a little bit about it with Deacon Tasfa Mikhail or Rowan Williams. I don't know if you had a chance to uh, hear that, but I definitely want to. You're the Melk man, so I definitely <laughs> want to talk more about that with you. Um, but first on the the magic is is interesting, I think, even how people categorize things, right? Um, I know there's a move, particularly because so much of academia is uh secular like coming from secular institutions as opposed to the kind of the the church backed institutions of the of the past and uh sometimes you see funny things like that uh I had you know my sister graduated from an ivy league school that was uh, allegedly secular but then they they threw some prayer in in the like graduation ceremony i remember a bunch of people got surprised they're like what's going on and you're like oh you forgot like this thing was founded as like a protestant institution like 200 years ago or so or whatever how many years ago so it's interesting even like how and it sounds trivial but how do you or how did that field kind of define magic versus just calling it like a different religion like i hear a lot of people a lot of people nowadays are actually like em embracing it not as a larp but like are you know i've seen articles in the new york times and in the new yorker of people like embracing being a witch or a Wiccan or, you know what I mean? Like, but talking about it in terms of like indigenous religion or something like that, like just treating it as a religion. And I've always seen the connection, for example, between, uh, I don't know how familiar you are, like Santeria in Latin America with the Catholic church, with the kind of, uh, I don't like using the word deptera in a bad way, the way people do, but the the Tenkulana or the the Asmat the the Matit stuff in Abinet is uh, what some people prefer to say. Abinet, I've never heard that yeah. for that. I, like, so how do they distinguish it from the traditional schools? <laughs> I, so, so this is actually an argument from uh, from Gedena Misvan Kebeda that uh, and he's given it at a few different um, uh, scholarly outlets um, that the that magic or magical religious or all of these are not terms that are used within the literature and yes. uh, he has all of these examples that he's gathered where the actual and also of course also interviews he's conducted and things like that where everyone consistently calls it abinet mm -hmm. and so his point is that well we should call it what they call it and they call it abinet so and of course it raises all these questions as you say like how do we distinguish it from the, the other <laughs> abinet yeah. uh, which may be an intention of, uh, mm -hmm. 
It may be an, an intention of the school to to not distinguish it because mm -hmm, that's true. It's a uh, as I've heard in Santeria as well as in uh, like in Latin America and in Ethiopia, it's kind of a protection mechanism to syncretize it with the dominant religion because the more you differentiate it, the more likely it is to be uh, kind of openly attacked. Is that I don't know if that's anything you've come across. The, the thing is, like it's it's such a, a spectrum and and where things fall on it makes a big difference, but it's all somehow kind of connected, right? So uh, like on the on the extreme end, you have uh, what are probably pre-Christian -pre religious practices being kind of integrated into uh, Christian ideas being integrated into these and then kind of becoming a new thing. But then on the other hand, like people who get sick and read passages of the Sana Mikael, that's kind of overlapping too. That's kind of part of the, the same deal, right? Because you could have something like Matafa Bahre or an actual like unction, right? But instead people are choosing like, well, I believe in the power of Michael and so I'll read from the Sana Mikael. Um, so there's always these kind of uh, gradient areas um, and that's really like in, in every mm, culture that always the, the debate that comes up is, I mean, magic is this really loaded term that's often very pejorative and how do we talk about it? And uh, I mean, the, the classic exa examples would be like in the Catholic Church, we have someone like Albert the Great, who's a, a, a significant saint, a doctor of the church, and yet he has all these books on how to use plants and stones to achieve certain, uh, you know, goals. Um, so, yeah, so that that's an interesting point. Is there a fine line for you between pharmacologist, like just less high tech pharmacologist, versus um, magic? Like, in, again, if it is the pejorative, and it's fine, you know, I can take the pejorative. You know, I'm I'm not an academia and I'm a church guy, so I can take the pejorative against magic, right? Uh, Satan, right? We deny Satan is one of the the very <laughs> common uh, uh, lines of the church. Um, could a fine line marker be, and, and maybe it's not, but things that are meant to harm other people versus things that are meant to remedy something with yourself? I know probably there could be then a distinction there, like like you said, between something that was clearly there pre-Christian and, and syncretized versus something that is just Christian, but maybe influenced by that other stuff. Yeah, I mean, the, the, these sort of lines are exactly that you've described are exactly the sort of lines that authors in like the Latin Middle Ages were drawing too. like, mm -hmm. it, it's one thing if people are using plants as remedies, and it's another thing if they're trying to summon demons, these are quite, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum, again, to say, but fr from the from the academic perspective, and there's lots of good writings on this, for example, by Richard Kikafer, uh, it's just not really possible to draw these lines because mm -hmm. of how much they overlap and how they're so kind of entangled and uh, and difficult to separate. Um, I mean, also even just again with the the, the church too. Um, there's this uh, how, how do they call it? Um, Richard Kikafer calls it the clerical underground. That we have to accept that if most of the people who are copying books. And our literate are clerics. And if we have all these books of magic, then it follows that the people who are copying them must be clerics. So yeah. it's <laughs> it, it's such this, you know, it's this such like so complex uh tapestry of, of things that is there's really no way to draw any fine lines, I think. Um, you know, the church does its best to it and it has to, but mm, you know, people will always do their own, you know, people have their own religion. I mean, religion is inherently also a person, it's, it's both corporate and also personal. And so uh, they're going to do what they feel like they should do for, for themselves. So, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting, especially the pharmacological self remedy element, how I feel like some of those insights have gleaned into the like old wives wisdom, you know, like, I don't know if uh, my grandma, I, I certainly don't think she was a practitioner of magic, but almost every Ethiopian grandma I know of, it's like when you get sick, they tell you to take a cold shower 
and they tell you to to drink at meat like some people have some different uh recipes for it but it's like something like tea garlic onion and uh a raw honey you know she had like a beehive in her background uh, back here i remember expecting like smooth honey and i got the chunks of beehive in my drink one time and i spit it out the first time i had it i said what is that but uh as i got older i'm like hey where's that stuff like um so yeah it, it it is interesting because it um getting to the point where you say there are no distinctions or that the lines are too hard to draw without getting into sort of medieval latin scholasticism uh and how many angels could dance on the pin of a needle uh it, it, you either go all in and say you know it's fine uh syncretize as you will use your own judgment or you like almost have a sort of uh dogmatic uh reaction against it and say like all of it should be gone which seems <laughs> both seem to be uh tough did you ever have any funny conversations with <laughs> people like wondering what you're studying and like how to how best to describe it to make sure they don't freak out or something <laughs> i mean this was also funny because you mentioned uh like people like wiccan and these kind of modern practices but in my experience, when I'm most people that I spoke to, when I just said, well, I studied the history of magic, they would say like, oh, like card tricks and, and things like this. <laughs> and I'm like, no, haven't you seen Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings or like that? I mean, that's still quite far fetched from, you know, what, what I'm talking about, but at least that's closer and more, I mean, in, in the, the sort of cultural mindset, but still somehow people always thought of like stage magic. And it was always very strange to me. Uh, and of course, I like Habisha people generally have this big taboo about it and, and would be uh, quite off put. But uh, I don't know. I mean, it's it's like reading Zara Yaakov's take on it and how he tries to argue. I mean, that was the point of my thesis was his his, his rhetoric um, is, is, is quite fascinating. And you can't, you know, argue against something as well if you don't know what it is or if you... Mm -hmm. Uh, try to stay back from it too much. You 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 won't really know about it and and be able to to refute it. So was it? I think I don't know if it's Getacho Haile that I've read, but I had read accounts that basically he was trying to be polite to his father, Emperor Dawit, but thought that his father was using that stuff too much and was trying to gently remove those those practices. Is that? uh is that on point is that part of the the kind of zeal for against magic that he had or was well, it just in, a personal uh, zeal in tomara tisbet he says that during the reign of his uh his brother yeshak uh whenever there was a plague they would pull out a, bi a book so large it took two people to carry and it was <laughs> filled with asthmat of demons but in his piety he burned the book and forbade them to ever use it again you know um it's really hard to try to to separate like Zodiac both had all of these different ways that he combated magic and they probably weren't all at the same time like probably one was to replace another when one was uh, impractical or, or ineffective um and also to separate like legitimate zeal from uh politically motivated things too right he mm -hmm. he accused um there was this revolt by Isaias, this uh, uh, administrator. And so he said, ah, well, I found Isaias was practicing magic. And that's how he was going to try to organize his revolt. And so I imprisoned him and he died by God's grace. You know, so that is, like, well, that, there's certainly a political advantage mm -hmm. to, to the outcome of that. Um, yeah. So it's, it's always kind of hard, you know, to, to balance uh, all of these pieces that are kind of there at the same time very analogous to uh <clears throat> the account of the stephanites right in terms of was it that they hated mary so much or they didn't want to prostrate before emperor zariacob which was the motivating factor and again using the the critical lens we were talking about earlier are you asking what they said about themselves or what other people said about them no that's uh that's very good. So getting into 
Melk, could you, um, we've done this before, but could you define Melk for the audience? Um, Deacon Tesfa Mikhail and I, when, when we went back and forth in this, I think I'm in your camp in terms of, I like to say what it is and then to translate it, but he thought it was such a technical term that he likes to transliterate the word and then leave a glossary um, or, you know, a sort of definitions in whatever text he's working on. The text, for example, he was using was the uh, the daily prayers, which include Melka Mariam and Melka Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, the loose definition that I always give for Melk is that it's um, rhymed poetry with uh, five rhymed lines. Of course, it's not um, true rhyme because it's only the, the very last syllable or sometimes not even a complete syllable that rhymes. Um, the lines follow set rhythms, but they're not technically metrical. This is always a difficult thing, right? Like, we, it would be nice to just say, well, it's metrical rhymed poetry, but it's it's not really metrical. Um, and uh, then, of course, it has this uh, feature of always referring to, to body parts. And this is where I would distinguish what I call milk from milk light. Of compositions like Milka Si'il or Milka Lisan or Sikuk Awatengil Mahalit that have basically exactly the same structure except for not having the body parts. Um, that's so why he didn't want to translate it. That's that's why. <laughs> that's the lack of uh, fine line. That's that's his reason for that. But you don't mind saying that because it's the majority. Would you say it's the majority from the corpus you've looked at that include the body parts? And it's yeah, like for sure. it's the aberration or the the irregularity to not have it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's yeah, it's it's interesting because they're always included in the same manuscripts and in the same lists and things like that. So people thought of them as being somehow in the same uh, the same genre. But practically speaking, we still need some sort of term to distinguish the things that, the, the ones that are that do have the body parts and have this specific usage in Mahalit. And then the, the other ones that just sometimes are quite random. I mean, I've seen a, a, a fragment of um, the Revelation of John, the Apocalypse of John, rendered in the Malk style. Um, wow. I mean, when it would be used or why it exists, you know, who knows? I guess because it's easy to memorize, maybe. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> but it, it you know it doesn't count as a milk in the in the most strict sense. So. Yeah. Did did you see any connections at all, but or differences between this and I don't know if you've ever looked at the the Sacred Heart stuff in Catholicism of Jesus and Mary. Is that is that totally different, or do you see any similarities? Because it's always been interesting to me that the Orthodox Church, or at least our, our our branch, our wing of it in Ethiopia, has this tradition. But generally speaking, the Orthodox Church doesn't like the kind of Sacred Heart stuff in that we find in Catholicism. So I usually say that um, the 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 body parts in in Malk. I mean, just in my own opinion, are perhaps more of a sort of mm, poetic device, or I say like a vehicle to convey the the spiritual meaning that they want to to mm, emphasize. Um, I mean, this gets to the question of where it comes from in the first place, and the problem is that we don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have tried to identify it, but I would say there's nothing convincing and there's no actual um, evidence that survives there's no early manuscripts there's no descriptions about which one was first or when it was written or you know this sort of thing so it it's just really hard to try to to say anything definitive about it it's just all kind of a a mystery just suddenly we have this huge um, genre of literature uh but <laughs> where did it come from and, and and my my argument, or I actually say my hypothesis, which remains to be proven, is that um, probably they were more irregular to start. Uh, the ones that you see more often in early manuscripts are uh, this one called Le Colon Melkeki, or Melka Se'il is often in very early manuscripts. Really? Okay. Yeah. And so a lot of ones that have either like not all of the body parts we're used to, or uh, there's some sort of other bizarre thing about some extra stanzas here and there, or the lines are funny or something like this. 
because um, also, I, I mean, we see this kind of loosely rhymed poetry in Abba Georgis and Zarayak. Mm -hmm. So presumably there must be some sort of intermediate step between that uh, rhymed poetry and then when we come to, to, to Melk. Um, usually people who talk about, who try to argue about the origin of Melk start with Melk and Mariam, but I mm -hmm. think that that's, I don't think there's any reason to do that. That's just a, a flawed assumption that somehow Melk and Mariam should have been the first one because it, it's the biggest one and everyone memorizes it and it somehow, I mean, it makes sense. Uh, you would think of it as probably being the first, but it's no... mini canonized by virtue of being in the daily prayers. It's, it's mini canonized. Right, but there, there's no reason to say that it actually should have been the first. No. There's no evidence. There's no. There's no real reason for that, and so that's why I think we need to to really consider all of the manuscripts that we have, especially the ones that have a, a likely early date, and just do our best based on the evidence because that's you know <laughs> that's all we can do. So that's right. So and in terms of the scope, like you've said it, like. On one end, you have Jesus and Mary, you have the Holy Trinity, you have more interesting ones like the reading group we did, the four yeah. beasts, <laughs> or the incorporeal uh, living creatures, however you want to uh, talk about them, or or the, the kirubel, <laughs> the cherubim, however you want to refer to them. Um, were there any medics, uh, I guess the, you said kind of the John's Revelation one, that surprised you like, oh, this also has a medic? Like, <laughs> was it was there any like uh in terms of how how wide the range or the scope of medics that, that surprised you or that you could talk about? So one of my favorites, and I have uh, a draft translation and uh, the starts of the start of a criti a critical edition of it is Melka Lisan, um, which is uh so each stanza begins to Mahitsenku so I take refuge in or I entrust myself to. And then it addresses one of the events from Christ's life. So it starts from uh, like his, his birth and his baptism and, and so forth until his crucifixion. Um, and then the theme of each stanza is uh, sins of the tongue, both yours and then other people's. And so it somehow always reaches this point where it says uh, like, protect me Christ from uh, the wicked tongues of my enemies or things like this. But it usually has these really beautiful and really clever metaphors. Um, one of the lines is, uh, even the, the tongue of small worms can fell a large tree. Um, there's a, uh, oh, what's another good one? That one sounds um, influenced by the, the letters of uh, James. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's also just, you know, a, a, a strong example of the, the Kene tradition and mm -hmm. the Semina work, of course. Um, there's also uh, uh, the, the tongue of, it's, it's not like the tongue of, um, of Caiaphas, and it says, but my tongue is Caiaphas's successor. Um, <laughs> So I it's, love that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's such a, an, a a really interesting composition, and it also actually features most often in magical manuscripts, um, because it has this kind of component of of uh, asking for protection. Um, so it's it, it's in a few Malkagubayan manuscripts, but uh, it survives in a lot of compilations of um, magical texts, and also even I've seen little like amulets that people make that just have. Melka on them. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting you said that. You'd appreciate this anecdote. When I was about 20 or 19 years old as an undergraduate, I didn't know the alphabet, but I was always kind of fluent in the spoken Amharic. And I was at a costume party, and there was a gentleman dressed like Sherlock Holmes, and he came up to me, and he said, are you Ethiopian? I'm like, yes. He's like, how would you like to check out this Ethiopic demon ward spell I have in my car? And I was like, what are you talking about, guy? I I was not active in the church. I didn't know the alphabet. I was like, man, if you read it to me, I can do my best to like <laughs> hear it. But uh, I definitely did not follow Sherlock Holmes into his car to see that 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 amulet or warding spell that you had. So so there's actually you're saying not even a bright line, or there is a bright line between the magic and and the medical tradition too. Are you saying? the magic tradition like borrows from the milk tradition or they're they're still separate though right i mean the the point is the 
I mean, the text is uh, is its own thing, but how people use it is the is the question, right? So it's mm -hmm. for sure. It's I'm sure the person who wrote the text was very pious, and people use it in this way. But that never that doesn't mean that anyone can't use it for. Um, I, I mean, I wouldn't even say like a nefarious purpose. Like mm -hmm. uh, it's just kind of questionable to, to uh, an unsanctioned like purpose of the church yes. would that be a fair way in speaking of like the magisterium like whether or mm -hmm. not is permitted or or sanctioned there's always the great uh talk about biblical hebrew there's this great uh biblical hebrew word that they uh um always translate as like strange and sometimes they say unauthorized either strange or unauthorized i think uh nakir or bide would be both good words in uh and in amharic um, so the place of Melka Lisan and Melka Maryam and Melka Yesus and Melka Sid, a lot of the ones that you study though, um, could you talk about like where in the church service it's, it's used, you know, like, is it one of the readings next to the Pauline readings? Is it after, is it before in the middle? Where is it at? Well, I mean, as of course, you know. It uh, it comes before the the Kadaze starts, but it's part of Mahalet, a, a, a hymnic service, a service of hymns uh, for for major feasts in the church. And so, um, when you look at, uh, I mean, it, it seems kind of obvious that we should have Malka Maria, Malka Jesus, Malka Mikhail. But then, when you look at sort of more obscure ones for saints that probably no one's ever heard of, like Malka Bartolomeus. The, Zemedo Mariam or uh, these kind of obscure ones, it's clearly just tied to the fact that the the church commemorates this person with a an annual you know major feast like Nix Baal or, or however you want to call it, um, and so it, it's just sort of a, a component that goes along with it. You have a tablet for this person, you add them to the Senkesar manuscript, and then someone writes a milk for them because that's just what you do when you want to have a big celebration for for a certain saint. That's right. And and so you've gotten to read these manuscripts as well as see them in, in the church as well, which is um, a great kind of two different points of view. Where, where do you find these um, manuscripts? Like, do you do you go on eBay and, and participate in <laughs> the buying storms? And I know some people are like, oh, don't buy this one, buy this one. Or do you go to particular libraries which have digitized them, or are they, do you have access to ones that you've seen in person? Yeah. Um, so of course, mostly I would use uh, like from from EMML, the Ethiopian manuscript microfilm library. Uh, also, the British Library has a lot of uh, digitized manuscripts, though some aren't, and so I've had to go to the British Library to see them. Okay, um, so you've gone. Yeah, that's. A... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I definitely need to go back. Um, they have so the British Library. They have a manuscript that's one of only two witnesses of an early Malka Arsema, uh, which I hope to publish at some point. Um, but I'm and I'm uncertain about some aspects of my trans transcription. So, um, but of course, also like Gunda Gunde is a good one. Uh, those manuscripts were all digitized, um, and those are a part of the one. The Gunda Gunde ones are. I don't think Gunda Gunde has like a website. Is that in Minnesota? Like it was done uh, by the my... University of Toronto, actually. So Michael Jovers and Vild uh, Vidakovsky sort of organized it, um, and it's really it's it's always surprising, especially to some of my colleagues too, that such little work has been done. Hardly anyone looks at these manuscripts, but they're like such an amazing treasure of of things, not just. Uh, viable witnesses to texts that we already you know know of but you know now we have a new and, and useful comparative uh, uh, text to compare but also just texts from the community so one of the manuscripts i worked on contains only milks for abbots of uh Gunde Gunde. um and it and it's even it's even more bizarre because uh if you if you really you sort of train and practice just on the pictures alone you can pick out how the, the manuscript as an object was changed over time. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, it's probably nine times that the manuscript was ad was added to in one way or another to keep adding more uh, milks for abbots to this one manuscript. Um, so it and I, I know that monastery 
and I'm sure it has a history outside of it, but I know it mostly because that's where the Stephanites were. Um, and even recently, like just before the Civil War started, I remember uh, a friend of mine sharing this on Facebook and I was I was listening to it. You know, my Tigrinya is not flawless, but I, I've been getting better and better and I was okay at the time. And I heard this priest who was in that area and he was rebuking the people for not celebrating Abba Stefanos enough, which is hilarious when you, you know, you study the miracles of Mary and in other parts of the, of the, of the church, a figure who's anathematized is canonized in this area. I'm wondering, is there a Stephanite flavor to the Melks that you find there? Or even in general, for me, the fact that you find Melks there, it's almost a disproof of the connection that people try to make. And I was thinking about this earlier when we we're talking between, I wasn't trying to say that the Sacred Heart created the Melk tradition, but I was interested if there were any connections. In the same way people try to make a connection between the Protestant Reformation and the Stephanite movement, I think one of the big things that's super different is that the Stephanites are monastic and sacramental. And and obviously some people talk about how they changed over time, but I'm wondering, are these abbots that have melks, are they the spiritual descendants of the Stephanites or are they totally unrelated and just in the same place? So uh, when I was working on this manuscript, just invariably in order to understand the commemorations and sort of who these people were, um, there's also, uh, quite luckily, um, Sinkasar manuscripts from Gunde Gunde that have these same figures added to them. So I could look into Sinkasar and say, okay, so the Melk would have been set on this day and this person has this brief biography. And so usually they will say something like, uh, and he came to Tigray or he came to, you know, Europe or wherever. Uh, and he came to the faith of Estefanos or he came to the beliefs of Estefanos. Um, but for the most part, the the Malks follow this character of uh, just a, a, a pious monk. And uh, there's another manuscript from Gunda Gunde that has Malka Estefanos. Um, so, so one of the ways that Melk manuscripts get organized will be uh, in sort of categories of saints. So first we'll have the ones for God and then the ones for Mary and then angels and then prophets and then martyrs. And then finally the Tzadkan, the monastic saints who come at the end. And Milka Estefanos, in this case, comes at the end. So it's not part of the martyrs. He, you know, he's not being grouped with Stephen or George, but he comes as a, one of the Tzadkan saints. And so I think this says something, too, about that the, for, the, for the sake of the Melk and for his commemoration, he was perceived more as being a, a Tzadk than a, a, than a martyr. Or, yeah, a Semite, a martyr. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, um, I don't know, if you, if you haven't looked at it, it's fine, too. Uh, have you seen the use of sigdat, of prostration, in the Malik tradition? And I'm wondering if if the usage of it would be different at all. Like, I'm wondering if anything, that would be the thing that would make them distinct there in uh, mm -hmm. in that area of northeastern Tigray. I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen too many instances where people recited a Malik and actually prostrated. I mean, I guess people who are very pious would do that but or, or, or i mean using the word not necessarily uh, not physically doing that because that that would be that would be for me if if for example um okay here's a great example i've always found it interesting that in the eucharistic liturgy you don't find that word for example for anyone outside of the holy trinity However, um, there's a living bishop who told me when he was a child that Melka Urban was not being practiced the way it was now. And even since I've been a deacon, I've seen different parishes do either shorter or longer variations of Melka Urban. But all of them begin with the, the sigdet or the, the prostation for Mary, mm -hmm. where that begins with the Salam Laki, that's in the daily prayers as well. And so I found it interesting that that's in Malka Kurban, which is another, uh, you know, what is, the, <laughs> what, what, like, I, I, from what I have heard, you know, it's not like, 
salam or salutations to the bread and salutations to the wine you know like like you said mm -hmm. it's one of the uh the irregular or the, the aberration mudks where it's not necessarily about body parts but it's it's included into the liturgy so maybe maybe malika urban is the most practiced or most famous mudk i don't know maybe more famous than malika harem and, and malika yesus by virtue of its uh, being exposed to the people mm -hmm. Um, the thing is, like, so for sure, there's uh, Melka Guba A manuscripts from Gunda Gunde that have Melka Korban, um, mm -hmm. also Basigit Salam, or uh, like Lino Hameru. Yeah. Uh, Part of Saatat, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. um, the liturgy so, of the hours. So there's definitely uh, Melk texts at Gunda Gunde that have exactly, you know, the same. Um, the same text. And I'm wondering now too to check Mahale Tzige, because Mahale Tzige has a stanza that refers to Estefanos as a, as a heretic. Um, <laughs> it's, it's something like, uh, those who reject your miracles are foolish, Mary, like Estefa. And I guess probably, I mean, I have to check now, but I'm sure that that stanza is probably in the same manuscripts from Gunde Gunde. Yeah. Because uh, the thing is that, I mean, uh, so for these manuscripts, they're a bit later, they're 17th or 18th century. So by this point, the whole kind of Sigdet thing, I I would say, had kind of faded a bit. Because, um, of course, part of Estefanos' whole deal was just monastic strictness. Mm -hmm. uh, and this isn't even unique to him. I, I was talking no. to a colleague who pointed out similar people from Syriac and other places where, again, they, they, were, they fell into conflict with the church and got kind of... Um, uh, you know, kicked out or, or or persecuted, but they were just mostly pushing for stricter asceticism, which was sort of originally, I mean, how SC Finals got in trouble anyways. Um, so yeah, I, it's, uh, I, coming from America, <clears throat> uh, we study the Puritans a lot and the surface value mistake a lot of people make is thinking that they just came to America for religious freedom, but they came because they had beef or disputes with the magisterium in England, the Church of England, and then they wanted actually their own stricter form of, of Christianity, but one that wasn't a part of the official channels. So yeah, that's yeah, that is interesting and and fair. Uh, the Stifa shout out to again, uh, going back to the conversation of uh, allowing the community to define the community in the in the hagiographies always refers to him like as the holy one or something and then his opponents call him like a demon so <laughs> so it's uh yeah it's it's pretty uh hilarious so so those are great places to find the manuscripts as well so you've seen them in person have you ever made any field trips to ethiopia to these places uh, I mean, it would be a dream to go to Gunde Gunde. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been to a, a number of places in Ethiopia, um, but it's it's really difficult if you don't plan in advance and make all the connections to actually look at manuscripts, right? Because if you just show up and say like, hey, like I know how to read this and I know manuscripts, <laughs> I'd like to see some. I mean, so maybe, you know, they have some that they always just show to tourists and they just, you know, hold them at a distance and here's a picture here's the next picture, here's the next picture, now that goes away. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you it's hard to really get, um, I mean, you'd really take a lot of planning. Yeah. And uh, for, for the stuff I work on, it would be difficult to know in advance, like I should go to this monastery or that monastery. Um, but so there's no clear them, center? Uh, there's no clear center of medical. So for example, in the traditional schools, in the past, Wadla in modern day Wadlo, the old Bedamhara was known for Kene, but for the most part, Kene is known as a Gojami tradition and they have it as well in Gondar. Liturgy, uh, Eucharistic liturgy is in Tigray at Debra Abbai. Dugwa, uh, the, the St. Yared's uh, hymnography is in southern Gondar at Bethlehem alongside Zimmari and Mawasa'it, the communion hymns and the Book of the Dead as well. Um, and then Maz'af or scripture seems to be more loose, but I know there are two big sites, one in, uh, in uh, Gwandar, uh, well, there are many in, in Gwandar city, in southern Gwandar, but also in Gwajam proper. And I know in Shoah, they, they do some stuff as well, but there's no clear center or like certification place for, 
for Melk as, as far as you're concerned? It's just well, wherever they could be found? Well, Melk, of course, is part of the Aquapan Bay, usually. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is... So Gondor City is where that yeah, is. Yeah, of course. Is. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the thing is that if you really want to see... I mean, firstly, I mean, I have this sort of obsession of finding every Melk I can. And <laughs> just some saints that you won't find their Melk anywhere except their monastery. And so if that's in you know, wherever that might be, that's where you need to find their, their mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a great one um, that Denis Nosnitsin had found where there's a church, um, Ura Paraklitos in Tigray, that is, I guess, the only church in Ethiopia that has a devotion to um, Tzadkana Paraklitos, these martyrs who somehow came from Israel worshiping Paraklitos and then were, were martyred by Jews uh, and then this church sprang up, and uh, I've seen this, I mean, through photos, the three manuscripts that have Melkats, Abdana, Paraklitos, but there's nowhere else you could have seen that except from these three manuscripts in one church. Um, and also, I would say, even if the, the strongest teaching tradition is in Gondor or in certain Akwakran Bates, uh, there's still this incredible value in the witnesses, in, in diverse witnesses of, of every Melk. Um, uh, last month, I was collating manuscripts of Makasil, and I've done roughly 40 different manuscripts from anywhere I could find a, a manuscript as Makasil. Wow. Um, and the, the amount of variation in the text is enormous. And it, it, uh, for, I guess for some people, that's maybe intimidating because it makes it you know, <laughs> hard to work with. But it's so, I mean, to me, it's so fascinating and rich to see how uh, you know different copyists approached it or how people sort of modified the text or you know and and for most of us it, you know here in the center we're kind of past the point of like we need to find the true original text mm -hmm. like you could try maybe but in most cases it's not really possible and it's just going to be artificial and how much does that really mean to find the original text I mean you still have to have Practically speaking, uh, you so usually have to have some sort of critical text where you've chosen what the, the final text should be. But And there's an arbitrariness to the choice. I was just going to ask you that because I remember in our reading group, I only participated one day. So maybe if you wanted to talk about that as well on the Arba Atun Sasa, on the, the four living creatures or the four beasts, you would have the variance in the in the translation. How do you select which one, you know, is like the footnote? or the end note versus which one you have in the text? Like, do you have a personal kind of system for how you, is it just what, what you like, like what you think is more brilliant? Well, the, I mean, there is uh, sort of established um, like books of theory on, on editing. Like it's like Lachman would be the, the famous one, the Lachmanian method of, of editing. Um, but it is, you know, it really comes down to a lot of factors, like considering uh, the age of the manuscripts, where the manuscripts are from, where they, who they, by whom they were copied, also the text, uh, you know, what makes just what makes sense in in the text. Um, there, there's a principle generally in in uh, philology of the lectio difficilio, like the more difficult reading. Mm -hmm. um, but in in Gittes, it, it maybe doesn't always work. Um, and sometimes it would be kind of silly to choose to try, you know, to defend the more difficult reading when it just really makes no sense. <laughs> and there's, and every other manuscript has a very clear reading that would, you know, work uh, uh, quite well. Occam's razor, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, you do have to be very conscious of uh, not just picking what you think is the best text or what you think is the nicest text or. Uh, the nicest manuscript, but really trying to weigh all of the factors uh, and to see what sort of represents, what is best representative of the tradition of the text. Holmstedt's position was that you can only really do synoptic editions, so uh, where you don't even make any critical choices. You just show the different witnesses side by side, and then people can choose for themselves. But that's impractical when you have 40, 50 witnesses. <laughs> uh, yeah. you, you can't do that, so you have to you know, at some point, make a choice of what appears in the main text and what appears in a footnote. That's right. Um, a friend of mine who's a, a translator of the Hebrew Bible, he he gave me that advice a long time ago. He 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 said, I think he learned it from his teacher. Something like it's 
it's cowardice not to or something like he's like you got to commit just commit and you know he's like do your little footnote or end note or whatever you need to do but commit to something and the actual text itself there was a, a prose writer that i i really respect but he's also into verse and he came out strongly recently and and this is in american and the anglo-american tradition of of poetry but he came out strongly against rhyming in poetry at all and i know there are different forms when i was a kid um you know in school i liked haikus and i liked learning the elizabethan sonnet or the shakespearean sonnet that each kind of had their different like the haiku focused more on syllables the sonnet had a particular rhyme scheme but really there's no doubt in my life uh, way before i knew what a melk was i knew about hip-hop and particularly independent hip-hop in which case the the rhyming there were a lot of different rhyming schemes it didn't like in the beginning of hip-hop it was very basic almost kindergarten how simple the rhymes were and they got more complex over time but i i wonder was the malik the first time in your life that you appreciated rhyming like what what do you think of rhyming as as a boundary is it good or would you like to see or could you even envision something considered malik but it didn't rhyme for, for sure it's funny that uh when i worked on greek and latin poetry you know i read like nonis and and some of basil and Gregory's poetry also like ovid and you know I just really hated it. I mean, reading you hated the, the poetry of, of St. Gregory Nazianzus was just, uh, it was just, it just hurt me in, in this, in, uh, and I never thought I would, I would choose, uh, let never mind enjoy working on, on any kind of poetry, but somehow Melk is just so amazing to, to me, um, to see in some cases how people, like how authors, uh really were so clever in finding a way to make their idea fit into the the rhyme and into the the rhythm um because on the one hand like so a lot of milk that you see especially for obscure saints or things like this they're just kind of uh i don't know service milk like they're written because they needed a milk but when you find ones where there was clearly a lot of thought that went into the composition it feels really satisfying somehow to read because uh you know like in good ones for example you see kind of like a punchline at the end where there's this uh constant references like maybe the subject of the verb is missing or a pronoun with no antecedent and so you just have to kind of keep in the back of your mind like okay there was someone doing this thing and this thing was going on and then suddenly at just the very end some clever way to fit in who it was or what it was and it, it, it just i mean it really adds this kind of uh feeling to it that you wouldn't get if it was just very like plain and and straightforward um yeah that's beautiful and i know you've begun constructing your own how did you begin doing that were you were you aiming to write some for obscure saints as well or or how did you how did you begin uh constructing your own melk i i mean i'm not really sure it I mean, on the one hand, it's a it's a really valuable uh, exercise to kind of strengthen your your knowledge. I mean, I also did this with students when I was tutoring. Like, it's one thing only to translate, and for Gettys, generally, you one would just be translating since you're not going to be speaking. But when you compose and you compose sort of right, like correctly, you're not just word for word rendering what you want in English and Gettys, but you think about how things are expressed get easily so, so mm -hmm. to speak like how the ideas and concepts are are rendered in different ways it it really changes the way that you you maybe think about it or it sort of deepens your your understanding in a different way um and also i don't know i think it's it's fun i i don't know that anyone maybe <laughs> except for you uh enjoys or, or cares to see them uh, oh but... stop it you recently opened your page that i've seen the in conversations ah, but, you and but, I had, but uh, have is, uh, have you recently saw. <laughs> but th this page is for translations, actually. So, so I don't yeah. have uh, things that I compose there, because um, I I wouldn't be so uh, so so uh, presumptuous as to analyze my own compositions. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, it'd be uh, funny to sneak them in to see if people could tell the difference <laughs> or not between the original compositions and 
and the tra and the translation there's I, I would say there's a serious creative component to translations as, sure. as well actually that um Haisanku, that word that you translated earlier refuge um or entrusting yourself i think it's very beautiful i remember having a back and forth with uh, Diak Ontasvan Mikhail one time because i i tend sometimes to the hyper literal over the 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 dynamic or the thought for thought for the sake of preserving that the uh, the indo-european languages as far as i could tell if i can make such a broad statement have a lot more abstraction whereas the semitic tongues build from the grounded reality and the reality i see for example in this word like tamahes anku is that it shares a root word with Ichage, which was originally Hasege, the head abbot of uh, Deborah Libanos. It shares a root with the word Hase, which is used as emperor. It shares it with Mahisan, which is womb. It shares it with Ichu, or which is Hisu, which is uh, uh, the betrothed or a fiancé. And the connection you see between all of these things is kind of this refuge, protection, or care that begins when you place somebody in your bo bosom or you're like you're like hugging or embracing somebody so i had as like an alternative like refuge or entrust yourself like uh i think it's uh i'm a mahas and nafsia from mahara naab and i think i said something like i place the breath of my life or my soul in your bosom oh lord and to some people it's off-putting to hear like bosom in religious language, but obviously you have like a the bosom of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and things like that. Where, um, you know, whether you want to go more thought for thought or word for word is absolutely your creative component. So I don't want you underplaying the creativity of it. So could you talk about a? It's a arke lal samunu, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mostly, it was just a way to separate from my personal Facebook feed. Like all the times that I just read through a manuscript and I find a stanza and I'm like, this is really cool, the kind of language that it uses or the way that it's been structured. And I just kind of think, well, I feel like I want to like share a translation of it. Also because sometimes they're from really obscure texts that, you know, I can't, I could spend my lifetime editing Malk and never do all of them. <laughs> and it, it it feels, I don't know, to me kind of nice to, even if I'm not going to edit and translate and, you know, do all this attention for the text, I can at least share a bit of it and give it a bit more attention as opposed to just being in a manuscript that no one will ever look at. Um, mm -hmm. You've because, immortalized it in that way. I mean, I've tried to. Uh -huh. uh, and and uh, also just, you know, to, to give people more exposure to it too, because, uh, you know, you don't hear it so much anymore, at least in the diaspora, that people use milk all the time. Or if they do, they there's this sort of standardization now where they just read it from a book. And so mm -hmm. there's the ones that are in the book and there's the way that they're written in the book. But then there's, you know, it's kind of just ignoring this diversity that exists in the manuscript tradition. That's right. I think Melka Se'il um, and, you know, this the kind of uh, latter part of what, is called the liturgy of the hours is practiced at the overwhelming majority of parishes there are some parishes that that don't but other than that it's like holidays a few times a year so you're right it's uh, definitely reduced in the in the diaspora as compared to in ethiopia and particularly i would bet at the the monasteries so uh people could go to facebook and search samunu, and i'll try to put that in the link to the bio as well so they can they can it. search if they type good as <laughs> yeah <laughs> if they type good other yeah good is poetry at good is poetry is the easier yes. the easier way to to find it and um it it, it is it is interesting that you mentioned kenny actually i've been uh trying to go through Magabi Mr. Bahru Yermias' uh, a book recently on the kenny in in english and i have books in amharic as well and I've been more interested in that tradition of late trying to learn more about it. W were there any direct connections you see? Because people translate both the word kane as poetry and people talk about Malk as poetry as well. Are, are there hard connections you see between those two schools or just kind of people who do one usually do the other? Mm -hmm. The Aquaquam bit might be the connection because there is a, 
a melody or zema to kane that you have to kind of pick up from the agua guam bit mm, exactly so kane still has a certain rhythm to it uh also it, it rhymes and um i mean the the number of lines varies right because you have ones that have three or eleven or seven yeah um but and they don't always rhyme in uh in a kane i've seen some that don't mm, but you're um, right there are rhyming ones mm -hmm. so yeah there's there's an there's an extent to which it overlaps Mm -hmm. um, but again, too, like the origin of Kane is also something of a mystery. So how they might have been related in their origins is, you know, now uh, impossible to say, but it's possible that there was some sort of connection. In. Yeah. Of course, also, the, there's, there's this legendary figure, Tawanai of Gonj, associated with the origin of Kane, who also kind of overlaps with being a magician. Or I, mean, I don't quite know so much about it, but this is the, the understanding that I have of, of who he was. Yeah, I, I don't know a ton about him recently. I read about him from Abahrui, but what's interesting, I did know about Gwanj before I started reading from him. And of the three main traditions, I don't fully understand why, uh, but there are certain elements that overlap, like having wax and gold, some Nawerk, which you mentioned earlier, kind of uh, double entendres and triple entendres. There's also this element that I think the Wadla school is more famous for, which is like, the mystery of Christology or of Christ and emphasizing things like that more. What I have heard of the people of Gunj, and I'll let a Gunj uh, person defend themselves if they ever come on the program, is that they're, uh, they're supposed to be a balance in the poetry where it's difficult. So you don't let just anyone. So there's an elitist component where you don't just let anyone understand it, but it has to be like somewhat ascertainable. What I've understood about the Gonj is they want it to be like unascertainable. I've seen some people, uh, you know, whether in jest or, or in reality, saying if you unlock the mysteries of this poem or if you figure out the hidden meaning here, I'll give you my neck. Like, you know, you know, hang me or whatever. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know how serious they are when they say stuff like that. But I, I've heard some of the Gonj people say stuff like that. I mean, uh... This is all, I mean, for myself, when I compose too, I, I mean, I don't go, I wouldn't say that I, I think so seriously about it, but I also, you know, try to kind of play with this of finding, uh, especially loan words. I mean, I'm very fond of obscure loan words in Goethe's, like from Coptic or, or Latin or Greek. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Askarain is one. Um, you taught me that one. Askarain, you taught me. That one shocked me. The fact mm -hmm. that Askarain is not uh, organic, let's say. <laughs> um but uh i mean I, yeah i i don't know that it's always necessary to see it so seriously but that that adds a dimension to it that it has uh uh this kind of depth um there's a great one in um melka abakarazon so abakarazon was the successor of estefanos uh from the from the Sephanites. and um i've only seen melka abakarazon in two manuscripts and one has uh this line um uh, um, estifanos uh, and you say, well, what's what's bargana? And it's from um, the physiologus, he's algos, that um, a bargana is a bird that uh, at nighttime flies with its mouth open and the moonbeams come in and then it produces a pearl from the from the moonbeams. Wow. And so it must be this kind of imagery, right? That Estefanos is the pearl, and Abakarazun is the one who kind of distilled it and made it from some, from its raw form into something that was beautiful and, and pure. Uh, but then in the other manuscript, it just has Abakarazun Betsu, because presumably <laughs> Bergana was was so difficult for the copyist that he just well, okay, I guess I don't know what this is, but Betsu fits. And then it, it just kind of, you know, why is Estefanos Bahre? It just kind of, uh, you know, it loses uh, something. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, sometimes I think about that too, though, that, it, you know, for most people, if they were interested in listening to this, would they really have any idea of, of what <laughs> this is talking about? Uh, or in a, assuming they knew Giz, assuming, yeah, assuming Giz was the lingua franca again that the way Israel revitalized Hebrew, we revitalized Giz in Ethiopia. And then it's like, well, but do you know the loan words to Giz? But even in um, uh, Melka Mikael, I was uh, I was trying to prepare a transcription 
and I can try to find it really quickly. I was trying to prepare a description from a video recording of a church that was reciting Malka Mikael because it was the uh, the annual uh, feast day. Mm -hmm. And um, the recent was, one, San, San Mikael? Oh, I mean, it was some years ago, this video. Okay. Um, but it had, uh, so I also, so I both looked at the books, uh, like the, the, the published books and also the video. And invariably, they all had used this word that sounds like it should be a real word, but actually makes no sense. Um, and uh, I, okay, so it was um, Harasawi Zeikanmi Tayafino. So Tayafino meaning so um, Tayafin, the plural of calf. So his so calves, and then. Uh, with O because it's the object of the verb and because uh, it's possessed by the farmer, right? So it's his. But when you see this T at the beginning and then no at the end, people, you know, you're likely to assume that it should be um, uh, like a, a, a participle of some kind. And so in the books and in the recordings, people say Tayafino, but that there's no verb that has these uh, roots that it could possibly come from. There's no Fayena. That it that it fits into, or, or fenoa, or so. I mean, fenoa is a verb, but there's no possible form that's tiyafino. Uh, and I, I mean, because then people are evidently just kind of chanting from the from the book and not thinking about it, which is mm -hmm. a bit disheartening, you know. Um, that it's just kind of this activity rather than um, a, a text that's appreciated. Um, but that, I don't know, maybe that's also kind of what I'm trying to do to, by having these translations and commenting on the text and, you know, to, to, to help people maybe think more seriously about the text itself. Because also yeah. the, the thing too that I think about is that when people talk about Kene especially, uh, usually people say like, well, it's impossible to translate. It's this thing that you can't possibly understand. It's, you know, and, and on the one hand, I really have the, the utmost respect for it. and and. In, a, in an extent, to an extent, it's, it is impossible to translate. And it's, you could argue that any kind of translation is impossible of anything, really. Um, but that it, it's never impossible to understand. I, I would, I, I would argue that you know, it, it can take hours and hours and hours of looking at the same, uh, words over and over again, having three different dictionaries laid out on your desk, and you know, but but you know, someone wrote it and it had some sort of meaning, and it should be possible to to understand that, and. I think it's nice if we actually have an understanding of these texts and not just kind of regurgitate them as sounds that we're used to, but appreciate that there was some sort of meaning there and they have a purpose and a, you know, something deeper than that. Yes. I'm in your camp or in your boat for this one. I think that there are words that are not translatable one for one. For However, sure. if you use enough words, because language is communication, you can explain anything. Anything is explainable. And if you have enough time, like you said, and effort, and if you have the resources, if it had some meaning to somebody, it can be explained in whatever language, English, Chinese, Spanish, French, whatever, one of the Native American languages, it can be done, you know? Um, you know, in fact, one of my favorite historical examples is that, uh, you know, this terrible war is terrible and all that. But in World War II, the, the usage uh, as a code language of some of the American Indian languages was, I think, a brilliant maneuver because they're so distant from any others that they didn't have experts on the other side. <laughs> so I think that's brilliant. You know, uh, imagine using Guz in that way, but there are experts all across the world in Guz now. <laughs> so um, I I look forward to you having your Wenver. Uh, where you teach milk and this is how these things happen i was uh, talking about it with another friend whose book is going to be published soon but uh he studied this this figure in the maz'af tradition who revamped everything and in his time he almost stood alone as a figure and was ostracized but it was his rigorous work uh and voluminous work that we have today in a lot of the Andimta or Tiraguame tradition, in the interpretation, in the interpretation tradition of the church. So I'm sure if you work hard enough and you're a very young man, you know, you have a lot of time to 
revitalize the the Malik tradition and you know i'm you know you're on my platform i'm sure you're going to be on others where people will hear and listen and maybe you know people can change some won't but some people uh, will change and you've already begun in terms of tutoring people so your students are already i'm sure getting imprinted with some of your uh, philosophy the same way your old advisor had imprinted you into uh, studying magic a little bit i'm sure you're imprinting mudk into these people uh, as well how how did people find you for tutoring and are you still available for that if people wanted to uh, uh steal your time yeah now now it would be difficult to justify um so i yeah i, I wouldn't i probably wouldn't uh offer to do that now though i still have some old resources that you can find here and there uh that i that i prepared for students um yeah it was really just something that i i kind of needed a bit of extra money and i also thought it would be a really good exercise for me uh, you know it's always good to get more um, practice teaching uh so for a while i did this a couple of years ago that i just had people pay what they want uh because also i didn't want to you know exclude anyone just pay what they want and we read through some texts and i help them with the grammar and everything and it also was good for me too because i read a lot of things that i wouldn't have found the time to read otherwise but then uh, uh was able to with these students like Malka Lisan actually was I, I read all the way with one of my students from start to finish and that was my chance to finally actually read it after wanting to for so long so yeah that's right it's a great motivation and so we talked about the the Facebook page but where else can people find your publications or or read your writings or do they have to wait for you to be done or <laughs> yeah, there's, there's not a lot right now. There's maybe some things on uh, on academia, academia.edu. Um, but yeah, otherwise, hopefully there'll be things forthcoming in different journals. I've also been trying to kind of keep a lot of things close to my chest because, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of uh, like sort of difficult situations in academic publishing. And, uh, you, you know, if you share too much, is it publishable later or yeah. will you self plagiarize and these kind of things? So there's a lot of things that I've been working on. Like I, said, I don't understand I, that concept. The self plagiar. I used to get mad at that one. Yeah, <laughs> I, I won't too. make you comment. I won't make you comment on it. <laughs> I never understood that one. <laughs> I know. I know what you mean in terms of uh, using it for other journals and stuff. But the self. <laughs> Sorry. Um, continue. No. So, so uh, in theory, there should be this uh, Malka Alsima and maybe Malka Marta that appear in text and translation within the next year. Um, I don't know about Maka Sil and Maka Masili. The work is there. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, polishing it and getting it published. Uh, and then also my dissertation, which will be on Malka Gubai, that also will inevitably be, uh, I mean, it has to be published and that'll be in a few years. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't know. Some things might appear. I have uh, in, in draft form also a book of translations of, uh, short milks which i couldn't publish because they wouldn't be worth the, the effort to to publish academically but would be nice to publish you know just sort of by myself uh so i don't again i don't know when that will appear because there's just so many things to juggle at once but uh hopefully these things will, <laughs> will come out to people well thank you for speaking with me today god god speed on thank all you. of this and god bless your milk ministry we definitely look forward to it here at the philosophy of art and science. And I'm sure my honorable watchers and listeners and viewers will also be looking forward to whatever you have. And I'm extremely biased towards the eccentric independent academics. So I hope one day maybe you have a gum road or uh a patreon of your own that people could support you on as well to uh give you those incentives to keep doing that that work because i feel like if you had the right things set up in your life i'm sure you would you would tr translate every monk or write about every monk because <laughs> you could you obviously have the passion and the fire in you and i'm sure that that will be a contagion for other students to enter as well Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's a real pleasure too, I have to say. So <laughs> thank you.